couple of weeks ago I decided to upgrade the uh, video output circuit of my 6502 homebrew computer from 640x480 resolution to 800x600. And here you can see the result, which is pretty good. Most of the time anyway. So when it's working we get a really nice quality image. It's full 800x600 resolution with uh, eight, 8 colours, just like my previous circuit was also 8 colour. And all of the pixels look good on the screen, there's no uh, visible artefacts, no shimmering, no jail bars, so I was happy with that. Um, I also made the test card for 800x600 to exercise various different pixel patterns at different points on the screen, and you can see that here. Um, and again, that's looking good. It's not the native resolution of the monitor, but uh, it seems to be happy with all of the pixel frequencies for the full horizontal width of the screen. When it's not working, however, we get bad messages from the monitor about the resolution being bad or there being no signal at all. And these are mostly due to the fact that the video sync signals in my circuit come from video memory, and it relies on the CPU to initialize that video memory correctly on startup, so if anything goes wrong there, the monitor doesn't get a sensible signal. Another artifact of problems with writes to video memory, or general CPU instability perhaps, is seeing bit planes from different images overlaid on each other, or bit planes with offsets from each other from the same image, which looks pretty funky, but it's not the intended result. So today let's start by talking about what the uh, requirements were for the upgrade, and then we can talk a bit about what went right and what went wrong, and perhaps then the, what the future is for my video output circuits. The first difference between these two resolutions is that 640x480 uses a 25.175 MHz pixel clock, but this uh, 800x600 resolution uses a 36 MHz pixel clock. So that had to be increased for a start, and that happens in the hardware. So here you can see the 25 MHz VGA oscillator and a gap where there used to be a 4-bit counter. And the VGA oscillator has been replaced by an SVGA 36 MHz oscillator based on a crystal with a CMOS inverter. And then over here there's a PLD which is taking the place of that 4-bit counter. And this does the 4-bit counter's job, but it also sends the clock signal to the CPU, various clock signals to the video circuit, and coordinates access to the video RAM. So that's it for the breadboard changes. All the rest of the stuff here is exactly as it was in the past videos. Oh, except I took the LCD off as well. Um, that's partly because I suspected that that was a cause of some of my instabilities. I don't necessarily think it was now. Next up we have the source code. So because the uh, video timing signals are written into video RAM by the CPU, all of the timing information is actually in the source code rather than in the circuit. And that's why so few changes were required to the circuit itself. So you can see here the initialization data for that part of the code, and in particular you can see the VGAH visible variable is set to 800, that's the number of pixels across the screen. Uh, there's the front porch, sync and back porch are defined after that. Further down there's VGAV visible, which is the number of vertical pixels that are visible, that's 600 in this case. And then front porch, sync and back porch, just like for horizontal. And all I had to do was increase these from the values that were used for the 640x480 mode. The divisor horizontally is still 4, and that means that I read 4 pixels at a time from memory. And critically, the horizontal stride here is still 1024, and that's the same as it was for the 640x480 mode. So this value is the total of all the values above it, rounded up to the next power of 2. And in this particular 800x600 mode, that ends up right on 1024. In 640x480, that total ends up at 800, but that then rounds up to 1024, and because that number hasn't changed, we don't need to change anything in the horizontal counters in the circuit itself. Similarly in the vertical direction, if you add up the numbers here, you'll get 625, whereas the total for the 640x480 mode would have been 525. Both of these are bigger than 512 and less than 1024, so again, we don't need to add any extra bits to the vertical counters in the circuit. There are other changes elsewhere in the code to deal a bit better with the larger resolution and load two different images from the SD card and things like that, but those changes are pretty trivial. So in terms of stability issues, there were two main things I anticipated here. One was that the increase in frequency from 25 MHz to 36 MHz would cause problems for the video side of the circuit, things like the shift registers not shifting properly or something like that. 
The other was that the CPU clock speed here is a quarter of the pixel clock speed, so that also increased from 6.3 MHz up to 9 MHz, and there are various possible repercussions to that. One is of course the CPU itself, and these CPUs are rated for this frequency, but successfully driving them at that sort of frequency on a breadboard can be tricky, and that affects the RAM, the ROM, and the VIA as well. In particular, I'm not actually sure whether my ROM is fast enough for a 9 MHz clock frequency. The other repercussion of the increase in frequency from 6.3 MHz to 9 MHz is that there's less time in the video half of the circuit to deal with the CPU writing to the video memory in between accesses from the video circuit itself. Now I was already pretty much on the edge with the 640x480 resolution. Now in that resolution, 4 pixels take about 160 nanoseconds, I think, and my RAM is 55 nanosecond RAM. And I'm asking it to do two cycles during that 160 nanosecond period, potentially one read cycle for the video circuit and one write cycle to let the CPU update the video memory. On top of that, you've got all the uh, latency from the transceivers and the counters, output enables and things like that. So I did a video on this before with a spreadsheet where I kind of added all this stuff up and showed that I was probably already actually overclocking things a bit. But now with the 36 megahertz base clock and the nine megahertz cycle clock, the total time for the cycle is now 111 nanoseconds, which is much less again, and you know the 55 nanosecond access time for the RAM only fits into that twice at all, let alone adding the propagation delays of the transceivers and things on top. So while I did try to do it that way at first, because you know sometimes the parts do behave better than you expect, it didn't work very well. So instead of that, I clocked the CPU at 4.5 MHz, which is half of the 9 MHz clock. And on the video circuit side, we don't interleave the CPU accesses properly with the video reads, we just let the CPU win that battle. So we give the bus to the CPU whenever it wants it, and we accept that that's going to mean that the screen blanks out during CPU writes to video memory. And as I said before, on the whole, this worked fairly well. I think there are some very slight jail bars that you might be able to see in the video here, but uh, they're not visible to the naked eye. The camera is much more sensitive to this kind of thing. So yeah, I was really happy with that result. The only issue is all the stability issues, and that comes because the uh, the sync data in the video memory is written by the CPU, so any issues at all with the way that happens result in a complete loss of display on the monitor, and that's no fun at all to debug. So where does this leave me at the moment? I am pretty fed up with the stability of this circuit, and I'm tired of fixing it, so I don't think I'm actually going to diagnose and resolve the issues this time round. I think a lot of the problems are actually due to it being a two-year-old circuit on a breadboard with really long spidery wires, and I've tried all the quick wins I can think of in terms of minor rewirings to resolve these problems, and they haven't really worked this time round. And, that, and actually that makes me just want to take a step back and make a more positive decision about what I actually want to do with video circuits. Because this evolved over time to where it is now, I was just doing whatever I felt like doing at a particular time, it might be a good time to actually just pick some specs and make something that achieves those instead. And having got so frustrated with uh, trying to debug all the problems with this circuit, it's really appealing to me to actually just go down the asynchronous route now and have the video circuit be completely separate from the CPU circuit, so that if there are problems on the video side, it will be really obvious that that circuit's the one that's at fault. And if there are problems on the CPU side, then I can debug that standalone as well. So that means that the CPU will no longer share the same clock as the video circuit, and the CPU won't have its entire address and data buses connected across to the video circuit. I'll have to design a different interface for the way the CPU interacts with the video circuit, but that's something I've been planning to do anyway for quite a long time, and potentially in the future could lead to uh, supporting more hardware accelerated graphics, which I think would be really appealing. But that's it for today. For now, I'm going to commit the code into GitHub in an 800 by 600 branch and probably not touch it ever again. But we'll see about that. I might still change my mind. See you next time.